the urinary system and the formation of urine and this is geared more towards exam revision. Your urinary system is made up of your two kidneys located in the abdominal cavity and leading from each kidney is a tube known as the urethra. It leads to the bladder. The bladder is a muscular bag that stores urine and the urine is expelled through the urethra. It's really important that you can discuss the blood flow into and out of the kidneys. It's examined often at ordinary level and at higher level. So blood enters both kidneys in the renal arteries and this blood contains a lot of waste and the renal arteries have branched directly off the aorta. Blood leaves the kidneys in the renal vein, so one renal vein from each kidney and this links into the vena cava. This blood has no waste. You must be able to draw a good diagram of the kidney and label these three labels. It is important because it was examined previously. So the first label is the cortex. It's the outer regions of the kidneys. And just think of C for cortex, C for corners or edges, and that's how I remember it. The middle section is made up of these pyramid-like structures, and it's known as the medulla. And then you have this structure known as the renal pelvis. It's sort of acting like a funnel, and the urine is going to flow into it and down into the urethra. The kidneys are organs of excretion, so their function is to filter waste from the blood, metabolic waste. The kidneys excrete water, salts and urea, and this is known as urine. Each kidney has these structures known as nephrons. They're described as being the functional unit of the kidney. There are over one million nephrons in each kidney, and they are these tube-like structures. Knowing the detailed structure of the nephron is really important, so it might be a good idea to draw and label a diagram of the nephron. So at the top of the nephron is Bowman's capsule and this is like a cup-like structure and it encapsulates or surrounds the glomerulus. The glomerulus is this ball of very porous capillaries. Next we have the proximal convoluted tubule, so think of the near twisty tubule. And then after this we have the loop of Henle. It has a descending limb, a going down limb, and an ascending limb, a going up limb. And then we have the distal convoluted tubule, think of far off in the distance. And then we have the collecting duct. And bear in mind that other nephrons would be feeding into this. Not only do you need to know the detailed structure of the nephron, you need to know where in the kidney each part of the nephron lies. So if you draw this diagram of your nephron and draw a line to show the cortex and the medulla, it's easy to figure out where in the kidney each part of the nephron is. So look at the cortex here. We have Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus, and we have the proximal convoluted tubule, the distal convoluted tubule, and the upper part of the collecting duct all sitting in the cortex. Then if you look at the medulla, we have the loop of Henle and the lower part of the collecting duct all sitting in the medulla. Blood enters each kidney through the renal arteries. That blood is rich in waste and the renal arteries will narrow eventually into the afferent arteriole and this narrows into the glomerulus. And it's in the glomerulus that waste is filtered from the blood. Urine formation takes place in three stages or three steps. So the first step is filtration. This is where the waste is filtered from the blood, but not just waste, good materials, useful materials also gets forced out of the blood into the nephron. So the next stage is reabsorption. I've said selective reabsorption, but you just say reabsorption. So all of the good material, the useful material needs to be taken out of the nephron and put back into the blood. And that's what reabsorption is all about. Finally, there's secretion. This is where certain ions, potassium and hydrogen ions, need to be put from the blood into the nephron. So they need to be secreted into the nephron. So the first stage in urine formation is filtration. This takes place in the glomerulus, which is this ball of capillaries which sits in Bowman's capsule. Capillaries are only one cell thick, so they're thin-walled blood vessels. And the blood in the glomerulus is under high pressure. It's under high pressure in part due to the narrowing of the vessels. So the afferent arteriole leads into the much narrower efferent arteriole. So for this reason, because of the high pressure, it's not just known as filtration, it's sometimes referred to as ultra filtration. So ultrafiltration results in many substances being forced out of the blood. These make up the glomerular filtrate. So water, glucose, salts, vitamins, urea and amino acids are some of the things that you would find in the glomerular filtrate. So what's not in the glomerular filtrate? Well, blood cells and large plasma proteins. So after filtration, a lot of the substances in the glomerular filtrate must be taken back out of the nephron and put back in the blood. So this is called reabsorption. 
it's termed selective reabsorption because only certain substances are taken back out of the nephron. So what has to go back out of the nephron and into the blood? Well, all of the glucose and all of the amino acids, most of the water and most of the salt are reabsorbed. And most of this is done at the proximal convoluted tubule. This is the key area for reabsorption. So very quickly, there's been a lot of reabsorption taking place at the proximal convoluted tubule. Most of the salt, most of the water, all of the glucose and all of the amino acids and some other substances such as some urea as well have been reabsorbed. So the water has been reabsorbed by osmosis. The active transport accounts for the reabsorption of the amino acids and the glucose and diffusion accounts for the reabsorption of some substances such as urea. So just for interest's sake, you never know, it might be in a question. We're looking inside the proximal convoluted tubule. You can see that its walls are one cell thick, but you can also see they have these sort of microvilli. It's called a brush border, but they're microvilli. And you know, whenever there's microvilli, it increases the surface area. So the proximal convoluted tubule is very well suited to reabsorption because it has those microvilli and also it's only one cell thick. And also those cells would have lots of mitochondria to facilitate or to help that active transport. Glucose should never be detected in your urine. Why? Well, 100% of the glucose is reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule. So if you do have glucose in your urine, it can be a sign of diabetes. So once you discuss what happens at the proximal convoluted tubule, you've discussed most of reabsorption. The rest is just fine tuning. So as you go down the descending limb of the loop of Henle, water is reabsorbed by osmosis. When you go around the bottom of the loop of Henle, the ascending limb, at the bottom of the ascending limb, salts are reabsorbed by diffusion. And at the upper portion of that ascending part of the loop of Henle, salt is reabsorbed by active transport. Then at the distal convoluted tubule, more water is reabsorbed by osmosis and more salt by active transport. Ions are secreted at the distal convoluted tubule and sometimes substances are secreted at the proximal convoluted tubule also. Hydrogen ions are secreted to control the pH of the blood. So if the body needs to reabsorb more water to take more water back in out of the glomerular filtrate, antidiuretic hormone plays an important role. It's produced by the hypothalamus and secreted by the pituitary gland and it travels in the blood to the nephrons in the kidney where it acts on the walls of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. ADH acts by making the walls of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct more permeable to water and this results in more water being reabsorbed. So when would a person need to reabsorb more water and then therefore would ADH need to be secreted? So it could be that you've taken a diet high in salt, you perhaps have had a fever so you've sweated a lot. Maybe you're dehydrated because you've been doing sports outside in the hot weather and you haven't taken enough water in. Or it could be that you've had a bug and you've been vomiting. At the end of this, we end up with urine and it flows out of the kidneys in the ureters towards the bladder. Urine is mostly made up of water, salts and urea. Remember that urea is made in the liver from the breakdown of excess protein. So what happens if something happens to your kidneys, if there's a problem with them? Well, if you have one kidney that's healthy, you can survive at one kidney. However, if both kidneys are problematic or there's something wrong with them, dialysis is an option and then there's transplants. So what should I know? Well, know the structure of the kidney. So be able to draw the kidney, label it, and don't forget the renal pelvis. Also know the detailed structure of the nephron. In fact, I would draw the nephron and tell the story of urine formation on your diagram. And also know the role of ADH in water reabsorption. So this is a long video, I know. I'm sorry, I tried to make it shorter, but you never know, this might be 10 minutes well spent. You know, you have to use your textbook, you have to do those past papers, write your own notes, best of luck.